We have many decades and many stories to cover, so I think we want to get right to it. And I wanted to thank Rachel for inviting me and thank the first panel for providing a, a, an entryway for us to begin. I thought what I'd like to do is just start, I'm going to read a brief bios and introduce my panelists, just so you guys, um, I think everybody knows one another, but there are probably a lot of people here that aren't that familiar with all of the artists. So um, to my right, we have Chuck Arnoldi, and Chuck moved to LA to study at Ventura College, where he discovered his passion for the arts. He attended the Chouinard Art Institute, which led to an investigation of traditional mediums, ultimately leading the artist toward a lifelong pursuit that challenges drawing, painting, sculpture, and printmaking. Over the last 50 years, each of his series approaches as a problem to be solved. An often subtle but occasional drastic shift in form morphs one series into the next. And you probably are all familiar because in the summer of 2018, uh, Chuck had a survey exhibition here at the Bakersfield Museum of Art. That looked like a group show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next to Chuck is Laddie Dill. Laddie's a Los Angeles native, and Laddie gained notoriety through his craft with materials such as glass, metal, neon, and cement. He graduated from Chouinard, in 1968, and by the time he was 28, he had his first solo show at New York's Sonnabend Gallery. <coughs> Aligned with the light and space movement of the 1960s, Laddie's work is currently included in Light, Space, and Surface, which is works from the LACMA Museum, LAC, LAC, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, that's currently at the Addison Art Gallery. And he's also included in an upcoming show in Copenhagen at the Copenhagen Contemporary Art Collection. And of course, you're all familiar here with the permanent installation of Laddie's piece when you walk in the entryway of the museum here. It blocks the entrance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Lita Albuquerque. Lita is an internationally recognized multidisciplinary artist and writer. Emerging from California's light and space movement, Lita's developed a visual language that investigates identity and the cosmos through painting, sculpture, as well as monumental environmental installations. And Lita's just back from Egypt where she had her work, she took part in the exhibition called Forever Is Now, where she staged a, an, a performance alongside the pyramids. So I hope, Lita, we can get to that at the end because Great. fascinating. Well, then we have Andy Moses. Andy attended CalArts in the late 1970s under artists John Baldessari and Barbara Kruger while exploring painting, performance, and film. He soon developed a process that not only stressed the chemical component of his materials, but also explored the uninhibited real life phenomenon of nature and the cosmos. And then we have Ned Evans. Ned, Ned's work pays homage to his love for Southern California environment. Having received his BA and MFA from UC Irvine, Ned has worked in Venice for over 40 years, pulling inspiration from the ocean and the LA landscapes to produce paintings and resin wall pieces that mimic the undulations of his surroundings. So thank you. And I, uh, if you want more information, I'll point out that each of the artists here has really strong, robust websites. So if you want to find out more, you can go to their website and find out more. So let's just get started. I mean, I think what is so fascinating to me, seeing the exhibition for the first time, is really just the sense of the network and the relationships and the relationships that speak to one another of the works in the exhibition. I mean, there's a conversation, and that conversation is a long-held one. I mean, so many of you have known one another for decades, 40, 50, 60 years. So... <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay. Stop, we're stopping at 50. So, you know, Laddie, I know you and Chuck had a studio in the 1960s. You shared a studio yes. with one another, correct? Downtown. Yeah. Yeah. Downtown Maybe tell us a little bit about what that... Well, I think we found... Uh, this is 
I'd graduated from Chenard. I was living over in Midtown in this big house with Chuck and uh, Effie Rosen, I think. Yeah. And uh, whoever, name? her name was oh, Effie. I have a hard time Rosen. remembering things. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, we were in this big house. And uh, one, of, one of the girls that was living in the house as well was dating um, Ron Cooper. And so Cooper, you remember this? Go no? Ahead, I hear this. Cooper just sort of appears in our lives, and he's got a mustache that's down to his waist, and his hair is like he had to start way before it was cool. <laughs> so anyway, he had these very, like I always remember his eyes. They were like really glossy. I don't know if that was good or bad, you know. But anyway, Ron, I still think he was brilliant. And he turned us on to a building down on Pico and Olive, and uh, it was huge. And um, I think it was like 149 bucks a month or something like that. Wow. But that was a stretch even, yeah. you know, so. We started this frame company down there. Acme. Yeah, the Acme Frame Company. <laughs> so it was like, one of the first few, you know, we figured that out. We were geniuses in marketing. <laughs> and, <clears throat> anyway, it got so boring that uh, we only had operating hours on Sunday night. <laughs> that, that bad. You know, but we met a lot of really crazy people during that time. Um, and I think it was during that period, we were also making art. Or during that period is when Joan and Jack came in, in into our lives, you know. Um, and they just, they had so much energy. I remember that. And they, um, they just, like, adopted us in a, in a, in a way, you know. And uh, it was very cool, and, and it's still cool. <laughs> you know. You know. <clears throat> Just had to get that in. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I was also working at uh, Gemini at the time. And through Gemini, I was able to meet uh, Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns and Klaus Oldenburg and Frank Stella. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so we actually got to know these people mainly because of the... Uh, the Grinsteins and the Quins. They were like the two islands of... Uh, and the Bas Wise Wisemans. Also. And the Wisemans, yeah. The, three, the Quins, the, the Wisemans, and... The, and, and uh, well, I think it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, <coughs> the art world then. It was such a small... A small world, you know, at the openings you would see one and everyone knew one another. You guys were going to one another's studios, but the market isn't, wasn't there. And to have people like Joan and Jack and the Grinstein supporting you in so many ways oh, um, yeah, was really an important thing to be able to enable you to do your work. Yeah. Um, and I know, so Lita, you, did, both you and Laddie <coughs> went to... Oh yeah, we go we go way back. I'm not naming years, but was <laughs> we're we're kind of Malibu people, and uh, took the bus to go to uh, junior high and Santa Monica High School. So um, it, w it was an interesting time. Although we weren't all super friends, but Maria Nordman went to the same school, and so did there was a couple of other uh, Michael McMillan. So I mean, there were so Santa Monica High School had that. I did not going to the art department at that time. I was more in theater. Yeah, there was one other guy. Uh, yeah. But, but so, yeah, so we go back that way, but then I, then we lost track of each other, and then when I came on to the art scene, Laddie was, you know, famous artist, and, and, uh, <laughs> um, doing amazing work that dealt with the ocean and California light, and, uh, was surrounded with with all his friends, and I really um, I, I learned so much from being around them. I came from a, a different kind of background in that uh, I first started. I went to UCLA, and I first started in literature. I was very interested. I wanted to be a writer, and then 
I realized that all my friends were artists and all I did was read art books, but I didn't have, I thought, wow, you know, being, because I'd just come from another country and being an American was freedom and being an artist was like the greatest freedom. And so I didn't think I could quite do it. So I went to art history, I have a degree in art history, but through that I met all, all the MFA students from there, uh, Lauren Matson and George Rodart and uh, Ellen Zimmerman, Astrid mentioned a lot of these people. Um, that and then we all had studios on Abbott Kinney. Fred Eversley was there, and then I got to meet Ron Cooper and, and all the light and, uh, light and space artists. My <laughs> husband at the time was a photographer, I think I told you this, and he um, did a photograph, the first light and space exhibition uh, in 1970. So I got to meet Irwin, I got to meet Wheeler, I got to meet everybody, and that was part of the the scene, and it was, and Ned was part of it. I think Andy was in New York, yeah. But um, and I didn't quite. I know I didn't know Chuck quite at that time, but it was this really the California light, you know, that we were all part of. I'm an ocean swimmer and the whole thing, so it's like that that quality of light, mark making, uh, the materials that we used, and we really did influence each other, even though we may not have been talking with this group here, but I was part of a group where we met every week, the ones from the um, UCLA, and um, Irwin would come and speak to us. So we had this, you know, uh, we had every week, and so we had this major artist. At that time, before I met Irwin, I thought that art was a two-dimensional surface on the wall. And then, of course, conceptual art came... Oh. I'm looking over here for Alan McCollum. I mean, for, um, sorry, Al Rupersberg, sorry. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, it was, when I started, it was like the sev early 70s, and it was like 1970, and it was conceptual art, it was land art, it was um, minimalism, and it was incredible, and everything that was happening in Venice. And, and so we, it, everybody spoke to each other, and it was definitely an interchange of, of ideas. So I, I love that idea too because you know just the concept of categories. People want to put labels on things, whether it's light and space or fin right. fetish, and it really wasn't like that. And I think one thing that so distinguishes each one of you is you work in such different materials. That that sense of openness and innovation. And so Ned, maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of your explorations into different materials. And you also, you know, had Irwin as a teacher and. Every Everybody from John Mason at UC Irvine, and I—I I always thought I was the youngster, but Andy's a little bit younger than me. <laughs> but I was, uh, and Lita and I are about the same. But uh, I was at UCI, and every single person in LA—Peter Alexander and Irwin and Moses, uh, Craig Kaufman—they were all the teachers, and it was, and John Mason ran the department. So we were you know, totally exposed to them, and it was like a whole new world, especially for me. I grew up in the valley, and I, I literally went to UCI because it was close to the beach. <laughs> and I got accepted to Santa Barbara and Irvine, I said, well, where's the water warmer? <laughs> okay, that, I mean, it was that simple, because we were so clueless. So were you, were you was And then you're thrown into a room with, with Irwin, and it was, Bob was just the most, yeah. he was like the best listener in the world. Yeah. He never said, oh, you should think about, it, it was none of that. It was always just listening, going, well, keep going. <laughs> Literally, he would just gently just say, all right, keep going and see what happened. And all this, you know, I'm talking about Chris Burden and Barbara Smith. There was a lot of people who were doing amazing work conceptually and a few painters, but way more conceptual. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. It's like every, every single discipline, every single type of material, I mean, from you know John Mason as a sculptor to Irwin, you know who's working with. I mean, I had a class and, and I said, John, I want to do a photography class. He says, Okay, what do you want to do? I said, I want to take pictures. He says, Okay, make up a class. And I, he said, Call it Photo 101. And I built a a dark room in my garage and I just went out and took pictures. And John said, Well, this is great. Okay, we didn't have any place to work. We didn't even have. There was nowhere. We we met in the the barn. So it was really, it was, back, it was very free. back to early California. Yeah. I was born in Burbank, raised in the valley. It was all just like, well, okay, this is what it is. It's just a new frontier. The freeway just ended. 
67, 68 when I started there. The 405, they were building it. And was surfing a big part of your life? Oh, absolutely. I mean, just the water. I mean, facing west. And I remember going east and wondering where the sunset was because I'd look out at the ocean. <laughs> I mean, it's that sort of... That, it orients you, whether you, I mean, we're almost all, I think everybody except Chuck was born in, in California, correct? Yeah. 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 And, and it doesn't he, matter. I mean, for you, you, the ocean really was an early childhood influence from, from a very young age. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, my father built a house. He spent many years building it and reconfiguring it, and it was a project of his for a few years, but in about 1965 or 6, I think, we moved into that house, and you could walk basically three houses, and you were at the edge of the cliff overlooking the ocean. So pretty much every day from about four years old to 18, we would walk to the edge of the cliff at sunset and look out, and that was sort of my vista, sort of ocean, sky, and that convergence, and all the different plays of light that would happen. And then as I got into my teenage years, and we experimented more with different things. You would see it sort of distorted or twisted or light sort of emanating in different ways. And it did create a ton of inspiration for me just visually. It would take me on these journeys. But I love surfing and I figured I'll get to be 18, graduate high school, move to Hawaii, shape boards. That was my life, which my parents were not thrilled about. <laughs> And I mean, my father always said to my brother, who's here, and me, he said, uh, you can do anything you want with your life. You could be a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> he said, uh, just be sure you're not a painter. <laughs> so growing up, I, you know, we would have all these interesting people over for dinner, and it was fun at our house. And I'd go to a friend's house for dinner, and it was horrible. <laughs> You'd see the parents would sort of come back from accounting or being a doctor, and they just looked like the life had been taken out of them. So for me, the art, art was always there, and I always looked at the art. My father was a well-known California painter, Ed Moses, and I would always look at the art. He actually, weirdly enough, didn't have that much of his work up. It was always rotating. There was this one Sam Francis painting that we had up that you could see as you walked in, and... Uh, People, friends of his would come over. He said, this is one of Sam's paintings. Nobody knows how he does them. So I would study this thing every day. I'm like, I'm going to figure out not only how to do that, but I'm going to figure out some stuff that no one's figured out before in painting. So very early on, it was an approach of mine, when I finally did start painting, to just start playing around with materials and see what happened and see if I could find some kind of alchemical, magical way to create work or have it create itself. And, but it was very much based on the imagery I saw growing up and being in the water, seeing the reflections, seeing light moving. And uh, so I went to Cal Arts actually. I got an ear infection my last year in high school, so I couldn't go to Hawaii. Those, <laughs> that, that whole thing was scrapped. So my dad said, well, why don't you, I, I liked films a lot growing up. And he said, why don't you go to film school? So I applied for film school. They said, no, we don't want you. And then he said, don't worry, I, I know someone. They might take you in the art department. <laughs> so Baldessari actually saw the film and agreed to have me in the art department. And I get there, and the main uh, foundation teacher, John Mandel, he said, well, you know all this stuff. You don't need to be in foundation. You need to go straight to post-studio art. So at 17 years old, I was in these classes with a lot of conceptual artists, Stephen Prina, Christopher Williams. Wow. Uh, Michael Asher was the main teacher. John taught there. Barbara Kruger, it was her first year teaching ever. So it was super rigorous conceptual school. And I'd even started making paintings yet. So I remember walking up and down the halls of CalArts, and I'd see these people whispering, there goes Ed's son. I thought, this is totally bizarre. Because I went to this private school, and all the parents were famous movie stars. And the friends of mine would sort of look at me and sort of pat me on the back. Sorry, your dad's not famous. And then uh, I was in this environment where he was like this famous person. It was surreal and bizarre. And I thought, all right, I've got to do something to kind of mark my territory. So the, within three months of going, I did my first solo show there. It was called Father Knows Best. 
And what I did is I made a bunch of paintings that look like pretty bad replicas of Ed's paintings. I think you might have been at the opening. I remember. So uh, at the opening, I took them off the wall and smashed them on the ground. And I had like this sort of poetry that was like, father knows best, but son knows better. <laughs> and I left the debris of the show up for the next week. And all of a sudden, I was like this instant, like Barbara Kruger, everyone's like, this is the greatest show ever. I'm like, fuck, I've been doing this for three months. So I got off to a fast start, but the weird thing was making the paintings, and I was never allowed to paint. Me and my brother were banned from my father's studio. It was in Venice, and we lived up in Santa Monica Canyon. We weren't allowed to go there. I said, you can't come here, you can't see what I do. And uh, the second I touched paint, I knew from that second on, that's what I would do the rest of my life. Wow. But I knew that I had to kind of, ex I had these ideas about exploring it. And then these tough crit classes where they would just sort of tear you apart. And I thought, I don't want to create the work and show it to that, those people. Yeah. So I dropped out after two years and moved to New York when I was 19 and just took a studio. Actually, I worked for Pat Steer, which was another... Oh, wow wild ride oh. but uh you were being told painting was dead of course i mean at cal arts <laughs> painting was right. completely dead and i just as i was told three years I four think five years many later. generations but i mean i love the conceptual art that i was seeing i love the work by all those artists but i just knew i wanted to do something different and i knew i wanted just to experiment with paint so that's what i went to new york to do and i would rent a studio out here every summer and in the summer of 85, I was making these black and white paintings. I think I ran into Joan somewhere, and I said, come by my studio and take a look. Um, I had two paintings up. One was finished, and one was about halfway done. And she says, I'll take that, and when that's done, I'll take that. So that my very first art sales were to Joan and Jack. That's and one of them, yeah, one of them is on the wall here from 1985, from those first two sales. Yeah. So Where's the other one? we don't know, but it could be in a storage unit back in somewhere. We'll find it. Well, I love all the, you know, so many of you have also done portraits of Joan. And I know, Chuck, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the portraits that you've done because you've really. Some of them. I've only done one. Hers. Well, perhaps you can talk about that one because it's very unique and it's. <laughs> Jones asked everybody that's an artist and a friend to do a portrait. And so I did one, and she had blue hair at the time, so I made one the little stick thing with blue stick hair. <laughs> it's not very interesting. Well, but, Laddie, you've done several portraits as well. I've done three that I can remember. None of them look like Joan at all. Right. <laughs> um, one of them is Joan as a magazine stand. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but she was like very involved with Interview Magazine in the uh, 60s and 70s. Um, that's how we got to meet all these celebrities. Remember that? Well, that was part. She did a huge article about me with a big giant photograph. Interview Magazine. <laughs> yeah, so she was very instrumental in kind of helping us Quite you had one portrait. I mean, I thought that the portraits that you did were very indicative of your relationship with Joan. And yeah. And well, you know, Joan is a very colorful person. I mean, I mean, <laughs> my, I rest my case. You know, uh, <laughs> I don't mean to embarrass you. Um, so I did one piece uh, that was. Very delicate. It went around and around and around. Neon. It had argon running through it. And I called it Jones, Jones Brain. And, uh, but it was so delicate <laughs> that it just sort of disintegrated on itself. <laughs> so uh, I, I went uh, back to like the John standard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So I, I uh, also did a, a, a piece that's just based on um, a lot of color that I see with Joan, you know, so it's indicative of that. That's great. 
I mean, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't also talk a little bit about Jack, too, because Jack was such a figure in all of your lives and really is such a stable, stable guy. And I know, you know, working with his law firm, I mean, all artists need a good lawyer every once in a while. So, Lita, you mentioned to me that you had met Jack actually through yes, one of his partners. Through one of his partners, uh, Russ Cully who was the president of the Fellows of Contemporary Art, and they had given me a, like a retrospective show at the Santa Monica Museum of Art. So that's how, that's how I came, although I'd seen Joan like way before that, and you know, saw this beautiful woman with this incredible blue and purple hair, and, and always was fascinated. But, but yeah, so Joan was first, and then, and then I got to meet Jack through, and then of course, through everybody else, then it was part of the whole, the whole scene, and it was quite wonderful. Yeah, Jack approached me and he said, "Do you ever need a lawyer?" Yes, yes. <laughs> and I and I said, "No, I'm an artist. Why would I need a lawyer?" Yeah, right. you know? and, Famous uh, last words. Yeah, yeah, really. Five pieces later, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. But, but Jack saved my ass a lot. Yeah, tell us the tell us a couple of stories from the maybe I the can't. wave the. How about the wave crest? The wave crest eviction. Oh, the wave crest eviction. Yeah. Is that is that uh, building uh, on wave crest sold <coughs> for to these French people? And uh, that was a, stu a studio of yours. Yeah, that you were studio working I'd, out. I've been on uh, wave crest and speedway on the, near the boardwalk. And uh, anyway, this guy calls me at ten thirty in the evening and and says, okay. Uh, in a very heavy French accent. Um, I'm sorry to tell you that you're in violation of your lease and I want you out you know, at the end of the month. And I just got, told him to go fuck himself. Uh, I had an 18-month-old baby, who, you know, and uh, I was like, you know, one page, one check, you know, away from... Uh, we've all been there, I'm sure. Anyway... Uh, when, uh, so I called Jack immediately, you know, you just call Jack. You know? I mean, the luxury of that is incredible. And uh, anyway, long story short, uh, the landlord tried to take pictures of things that I had bootlegged, you know, and Typical studio situation. And it sounded like you had actually retrofitted the whole space yeah. with bath, with walls oh, and yeah. bathrooms. Oh, yeah. No, it was like a movie yeah. set. You know? Full on, yeah. In fact, Bankston used to say, you know, just tell them it's a movie set. You know? <laughs> so we had um, this guy in the neighborhood, uh, Bob Harrison, um, we called him Bongo Bob, but don't call him Bombo, Bongo Bob to his face, you know. Uh, and Bob was just had a beautiful soul, and he was a Venice fixture. Drove around in an old uh, school bus, and uh, but he had a, a sledgehammer, and I was in a jam, you know. So I said, I have to remove everything, and he goes, Oh, no problem. And he comes in with a sledgehammer, and just like. Wham, the sink's gone, you know, one swing. So by the time the city came with the new owner, I, you know, there was nothing there. So anyway, long story short about Jack uh, and, this, and this is that uh, I ended up getting the rest of my lease, which had seven years left on it, free. Whoa. Which is amazing. And, That's... and, and that was that, you know. And, uh, you know, if you ever need a lawyer, that well, kind of thing. Jack to the rescue. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and Chuck, you had a couple of good stories about Jack and the law firm. Well, I can tell you one story. So yeah, maybe you put appropriate, your... appropriate to that was um, I used to play uh, tennis on the weekends up at J.C. Agajanian's house, which is Joan's father's house. And I'd play with Jack. And like Matt Byrne, who was Superior Court judge, and John Vandekamp, and people like that. And one morning they told me, you know, Chuck, you can get away with anything once, maybe even murder with us as your friends. <laughs> See, <laughs> I mean, that's how powerful they were. But um, we we were sharing a few stories. We had lunch the other day, and 
I was telling her a story. <clears throat> I was having a show at Nick Wilder's one, one year. And the thing about Joan and Jack was they were in Beverly Hills. So usually on the way into town to have a show, we'd always stop over their house for a cocktail. And we'd get there, and they were really, you know, great, real generous. You know, it'd be banks, and all of us, and we'd be hanging out. And this one particular time, I had this opening, and we had a few drinks, and we just weren't in a hurry to get to the goddamn opening, you know? So we had a few drinks. Finally, we went over to Nick Wilder's, and I walked in, and Nick runs up. And the to show me. was for you, right? The show is my show. The show, show. is Chuck's show. One person okay. show, opening that <laughs> night. I walk in, he says, where have you been? I said, over at Joan and Jack. She says, the Beatles just left. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they came to the opening, but we were having cocktails over at the Quinn's, you know, which is sort of typical. I mean, back in the day, you have to understand, it was a different art scene. And I was telling another story. Uh, Jack used to trade us all art for, you know, legal services. And one time, uh, Roche traded him a piece that said, no, no job is too small. And so at the law firm, they'd hang the art in the, in the hallways. And any, any of the lawyer's offices, if they'd hang that particular one, they'd want it moved immediately. <laughs> because the lawyer would feel like, Oh, I only get the like. I don't want that. Get that out of here. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, but uh, but Jack would put it where he wanted and just uh, test everybody with it. <laughs> well, that I mean, I think it's worth noting too that the law firm also collected work and that oh, yeah. that they had you know huge. pieces everywhere and they really that was a way of supporting the Los Angeles artists and that it was insta Amazing like stuff. big yeah. installations like very um, you know a Dwayne Valentine and. Um, Fred Eversley and you know very Bruce large Thomas. yeah very large scale experimental work and that must have been amazing to have those kind of support system back then it was huge yeah. I mean it, it was everything yeah the Quins the Wisemans and yeah. the Grinsteins yeah I, took I, all of us guys in and introduced to us a whole world of in a sense money collectors yeah. and stuff because we were just a bunch of dumb artists you know making art but they introduced us to a whole level of real society, and it changed all of our lives. Well, it would like, like the Grinsteins, when they'd have those parties, and it'd be Andy Warhol or David Bowie or what, anybody who came to town, they would do a party. Anybody and everybody. I think that the Grinsteins changed the, the history of California by opening up Gemini and inviting all those artists out, and so we got to party with them. And so you'd meet, you know, Warhol, Rauschenberg, Frank Stella, and we'd hang out with them and party. And then if you, if you're going to go to New York, and they'd say, well, come on over and have lunch. So you go to Jasper's or Frank's. And I never thought of them as famous artists. I just thought of them as these great people we met. And so it made making art seem like just something that people do. It wasn't like this elite thing that you try to do, you know. Yeah, all three families were so generous and really made our scene, made the art scene. Uh, I remember with Wiseman, um, I, I once, I think I was part of the Cedar Sinai. Um, that she was starting to put art in the in the museum, and I had a van at the time, and she needed like a painting, and I had this gigantic painting in the back of my car that was rolled up, and I just took it out, and she bought it right there on the spot. So that was like one of my first uh, real sale. And then um, the Grinstein funded the project that I did at the Washington Monument. And then one day we all went to Washington, D.C. On, on Wiseman's private jet, you know, at Ruscha and a whole, a, a lot of people, a lot of artists. And it was amazing to have, like, like Chuck's saying, you know, to be all of a sudden part of this extraordinary, extraordinary social caliber and artistic creativity. And and at the Grinstein, seeing Phil Glass all the time, and like a lot of a lot of just major major creators, and it was just great. And without th these families, uh, I you know where it would be a totally it would be, it would be very different. It would be very for me. Different. I mean, the one thing I can say, I I spent 18 years in New York, 82 to 2000, and New York was brutal. And you would just sort of meet these collectors. They'd sort of come dive in and then buy one artist and get the prices going up. But there was, maybe I just was in the wrong place, but you just didn't have this sense of community, this openness, this support. And like I said, I met Joan one so I think I'd met you prior to that, but ran into you somewhere that summer, invited you over, you came over, you bought two paintings, and those were the first two sales I made. And the difference between 
New York and LA, it, it was palpable. And then the artists, yeah. everyone was friendly out here. In New York, if you were at an opening and a collector would come in, your friend would turn. <laughs> so you trying to get around, you'd get the, the dark shoulder. And, I mean, the competitiveness was insane there. And I was there all through the 80s and there'd be, every day my phone would be ringing, have you seen so-and-so? They're the hottest artists in the world this week and then the next week and the next week. And these people would sort of appear and then you wouldn't hear about them. And you'd say, what happened to so-and-so? He had got a bad review. <laughs> He's done. <laughs> He's like, oh and then they'd, they'd move out. So there was something about coming back to LA and meeting my father's friends yeah. and sort of seeing what was going on here. It was just so different. And it was, and it was people um, like Joan and Jack that, you know, that made it great. And the generosity of spirit and and connected. Never had to pay family. for a dinner either. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I missed out. I got it. I, I, I think that oh, can't be underestimated too, in terms of just how that built the scene and how that built the support system. You know, when you hear stories about the Grinsteins having like open tabs at the art at art supply places, or you know, getting Judy Chicago a forklift from you know Stanley's. Uh, that was me. Yeah. <laughs> did, did he get? Did they get you a forklift? Oh, the same thing. Did, did the they same get you a forklift? Oh yeah. I got one too. Yeah. You got one. When, <laughs> when I, when I Forklifts for everybody. Billy Al. When I was a student. Billy Al on this because yeah. he's the reason most of us met Joan and Jack. That's but true. Billy Al, you know, yeah. he's, we'll call Stanley, and we were doing a building, and he just did, within hours we had the forklift delivered because we had 1,600 sheets of drywall to hang in 40,000 square feet down to. <laughs> Well, I feel like Billy Al, you know, and I told this to Joan, Billy Al really was kind of the catalyst. impetus, yeah, and the catalyst because he, Joan's father was a race car promoter, owned a racetrack. Billy Al was a motorcycle racer and racing there. And so Joan had met Billy Al and, and Billy and, was the... And Bob Irwin drove the pace car. Yeah. <laughs> I was asking Joan about that. But, you know, but Billy was that kind of the connective tissue to introduce you to his friends and to subsequently to the rest of the, the gang. Absolutely. And I think, you know, when I say the gang, I feel like it was kind of Lita, I, I need you to weigh in here too because <laughs> it was such a macho oh, yeah. scene yeah. and it really was the guys. And so... I, Tell us a little bit about what that was like working in that sort of environment. Well, I'm a little sister to a big brother, so it, it's it was I've always kind of accepted that kind of role in a way. Um, but it was it was definitely a macho world. But but I felt accepted, so it wasn't. But but in terms of getting the exhibitions, getting I mean what we all know, you know the the prices, all of that. I mean there's there's no. It, they, I mean, Judy Chicago became who she became because of this 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 issue. I mean, she really, I think she really did open up a lot for, for women artists that was outrageous. Like, we were not considered the same. But then then it did open up after a while. But but I like hanging around guys, so it was kind of, <laughs> kind of cool. <laughs> there, there was a saying, well, you, you, can, you can play in the clubhouse, but you can't join the club. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty bad. <laughs> it's very no, but, you know, seriously, uh, we're talking almost exclusively about Venice. Yeah, we are. That area. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's other things going yeah. on in other places, but... Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to address one thing. I've, I've always wondered who coined the phrase light and space. Yeah. Good question. You know, uh, I mean, Vermeer, maybe? Uh, I don't know if it goes back <laughs> that far. <laughs> <laughs> was, it, was it Maurice Tuckman? I was going to say that, but... Was it Maurice? I think no. it was huh? I know. Maurice, I know. Was it I, Maurice Jan Tuckman? Butterfield did, but that was a was really Jan good... Butterfield. Vermeer was really good. That was really good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was Jan Butterfield, and she wrote this beautiful book of... One of the few books that really talks about the, the beginnings of who were the, the real originators of light and space. And how could we not all... I mean, both Laddie and I are in that show in Copenhagen. And there's about 27 artists in there, most of them from California, although they have some yeah. of the newest, New, newest, newest generation of Europeans as well. But, but it's, 
how can you be in Southern California and not deal with enlightened space? But then there's the people like like Irwin who was almost preaching that, you know, teaching us about about space and and how you can make a mark and it changes the entire space. I'll never forget. I, I tell this story quite often uh, at Mitsuno Galleries where he once had a show where all he had was a black tape at the horizon level, at the eye level, and all of a sudden it became two volumes, right? And it blew me away that you could do something like that. And it was art and it taught you, it taught you how to see. And I think we really, and, and uh, we really, what, what happened in Southern California at that time was, was huge. And the fact that a, a young curator from Copenhagen wants to do a show of light and space shows that and wants to say, hey, we also have that. The other thing, um, oh God, it just escaped me. I wanted to say, just left me. I'll, I'll have to, damn it. Well, one thing I'll say about <laughs> um, light and space, it's interesting. I grew up seeing the work, then I went to CalArts, then I moved to New York the black and white painting in the other room, everything I did in New York was pretty much black and white. And it was looking up, because that was your viewpoint in New York. You were squeezed in, you were looking up. When I moved to LA, and back to LA in 2000, I had a little shack on PCH in Malibu, and I would drive to my studio in Venice every day and re-experience what I'd seen as a kid growing up, walking to the edge of the cliff, seeing that kind of infinite space and that light and the plays of light. And immediately I started working with these pearlescent white paints, started making these curved paintings. And it was in direct response. It wasn't thinking about light and space work. It was direct response to living in Southern California and sort of having that permeate me. And I think it's something that's very strong here. You can see where the work came from in every generation. Yeah. And there is a connection to the environment here. I think that's strong. I know what I was. I was remembering Robert Irwin, who had a show at at the Whitney, and in nineteen around nineteen seventy, maybe a little later than that, and no one saw it. Like no one saw that it was art, right? Because it was like it, because of the scrims and what he was dealing with. They, it went totally over their heads. It just didn't get it. Also because it was in New York. But but it's it's monumental, really, what what we created here, and what the initial people did create, and the initial artists. Yeah. Really During fantastic. During the same period that she's talking about, I was a teaching assistant to Hal Glicksman, and he ran the UCI gallery, and Hal had Larry Bell, Bruce Nauman, Eric Orr, and Maria Nordman come to the university, and we did those four shows, and they were all just so temporary ephemeral and it was like Irwin. It was magical if you were there, but it, it was like they came and they just evaporated. And it's kind of- Ephemeral. <laughs> well, I think um, it's wonderful to hear that, that each one of you are continuing pushing the envelope and doing such like innovative things. The work is getting out there and that the idea of like light and space and California art in particular is a very distinctive flavor to it. And so it's wonderful to see that. And I think you can see that, you know, in the galleries here, but also in all the exciting projects that you all are continuing to do. So thank you so much. I think it's great. I'm getting the, the, the time, time. Is, yeah, <laughs> the time I'm and thank deeper. you all. And that's it. Okay. Thank you so much, Joe. Again, thank you to our panelists this evening and thank you to you all for coming. I do want to make sure that we acknowledge, again, a couple of our sponsors that are here this evening. We have Lisa from the JHM Foundation, Craig Kroll Gallery, Bakersfield Built Foundation, and Laura L. Molson. So thank you for being here. Yes. Thank you so much, Laura Maslin. And thanks to the Quins. And thank what? Thanks to the Quins. Oh, no, and that was my final. Joan, can you please stand up? We want to make sure that everybody gives you a round of applause. Yes, thank you so much.